Well, ready to begin. We are still continuing on uh, the Bible study of Jeremiah, and we're on Jeremiah chapter 4 today. So do go ahead and look at your handout. We'll begin with verses 1 and 2, our sheep. These verses are a call for the ever-changing Judah to return to the unchanging God. The word return or repent is used twice to emphasize the anxious and merciful call of the Lord. The ESV is a better translation of the Hebrew. So that's why I put it in your italics. And it reads, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives, in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. So that's verses 1 and 2 from the ESV. And this is the first question that we have. What are the three conditions in verses 1 and 2 that God has? We have, um, if you look, let's see, right, removing the detestable things there. And uh, in the New King James, that's abomination. So that would be idols, basically. The second one would be not to waver. If you remember the story of Elijah and Baal, that confrontation, the prophets of Baal, and Elijah asks the people of Israel, how long will you go limping between two opinions? Right? If Baal's God, serve him. If Yahweh's God, serve him. Same thing here. Do not be wavering back and forth between Baal and uh, Yahweh, or the Lord. And third, if the third condition is to swear, uh, to take an oath, in other words, as the Lord lives. And this swearing is to be done in truth, in justice, and in righteousness. That means the whole life must be in keeping with their oath and not just in pretense. So if you look at uh, chapter 3 there in your Bible, verse 10, it says, And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. So in hypocrisy. She would say one thing, but really didn't mean it. So those are the three conditions, then. And that leads to our second question. What is the promise in verse 2? And we see that at the end of the verse, that the nations shall bless themselves in him. Speaking of Yahweh of God. And that means by blessing themselves in him, they would become partakers of uh, that salvation, along with the rest of the Jews or the Judaites or Israelites. And this is kind of like what Pastor Rieger was talking about last week from Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it in the name of the Lord. So prophesying how there will be a Many of the Gentiles, many of the non-believing, um, non-Jewish nations will come to faith, prophesying about the time of really fulfilled with Christ, sending out the apostles, right? Go therefore into all the nations, making disciples. So those are verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, would somebody like to read verse 3? For thus says the Lord to the man of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Thank you. So we have a, a note here, our sheet. The fallow ground is land that has not been worked or broken. So many of you farmers know. Uh, to clear and plow fallow ground is very difficult. And it's sometimes tempting, I guess in the ancient world, to do a superficial plowing and then sow. But the problem in doing that would be that the weeds will come back quickly and then overtake the whole field again. So Jeremiah is using this picture to show the condition of unbelieving Judah's heart, which can also be applied to all people's hearts because of original sin. Judah's heart and our heart, just like the land, needs to be cleansed by a deep and repeated plowing out of sin. So what, the third question here. Verse 3 is continuing the call of repentance because the fruits of truth, justice, and uprightness cannot grow out of a heart encased in the impervious shell of impenitence and overgrown with the weeds 
of sinful desires. What was Israel slash Judah's mission or purpose? They got split. Let's take first look at Genesis 12, verse 3. And if somebody would like to read that verse. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that's speaking to Abraham. So God separating Abraham out, which would be the, the line of the Jews, was done in order to bless all the nation. Ultimately with the promised uh, seed of the woman, that is Jesus, was going to come from that line. That would be the ultimate blessing. So Israel, or Judah, was to be a blessing to all the nations. Now, if we take a look at Leviticus 20. Verse 26. And I'll read that. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. So God intentionally separated the Israelites out, or the, the Jews out there, in order to be holy, so that the other nations would then see them, and then want to know what's different about them, because they'd be different than all the other peoples. And they would come to there, to um, Jerusalem, as King Solomon in his prayer, uh, when he dedicated the temple, prayed how the nations would come to the temple, and then they would learn about uh, this promised Savior who would come to defeat Satan and sin. And then our last verse is Romans chapter 3. Yeah, somebody would like to read that. What did then stand him to do? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them that were committed the oracles of God. So the oracles of God would be God's word. So they were intentionally to be separate from the other nations so that they would not fall also into idolatry, which they, were, they are in Jeremiah. But by keeping themselves separate, they were to preserve God's word, um, which we still have the Old Testament. It's very well preserved, and they did do a good job of doing that. Before we go on to question four, any, any questions? Okay. Well, let's go back then to Jeremiah, verse 4. And verse 4 reads, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn so that no one can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. So, the expression, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, is also used in Jeremiah 6, verse 10, and in Exodus 6, verse 12 and 30. In Exodus, Moses uses it. He says, I can't go to these people. I can't go to Pharaoh because I'm a man of uncircumcised lips, meaning that he can't talk uh, eloquently. And in Jeremiah 6, verse 10, that's talking about their ears uncircumcised, meaning they won't receive God's word. So to be uncircumcised here means like any kind of organ that's incapable of absorbing feelings or impressions from the outside. It refuses to listen or refuses to do anything. And this expression is used throughout the scriptures. So our question or verse 4 is, read Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, and verse 30, chapter 30, verse 6. Who circumcises the heart? So let's look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 16 first.
Would somebody like to read that verse? Thank you. And now that ties into then, all right, so Moses, this is Moses' kind of farewell sermon before he dies, and he's telling this to the Israelites there gathered to circumcise the foreskin of their heart. Don't be stiff-necked. That means stubborn or rebellion. And then if you go to flip to 30, chapter 30, verse 6, we have there, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart in the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. So it is God who circumcises the heart. And this kind of this theme of circumcising the heart carries on into the New Testament. If you look at Romans 2, I think we'll just read Romans, verses 28 and 29. We read there that for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, that means like a believer, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Therefore, to have a circumcised heart, both in the Old Testament and the New, means to have faith or trust in God, and it's only given by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I have a quote here from uh, Walter's Law and Gospel that fits with that. And Walter writes, When demanding faith, like when preaching or talking to somebody, we do not lay down a demand of the law, but issue the sweetest invitation, practically saying to our hearers, Come, for all things are now ready. Luke 14. When I invite a half-starved person to sit down to a well-furnished board and to help himself to anything he likes, I do not expect him to tell me that he'll take no orders from me. Even so, the demand to believe is to be understood not as an order of the law, but as an invitation of the gospel. So here in verse 4 in Jeremiah, that's what Jeremiah, and that's what God is doing. He's uh, talk, first verses one and two is talking about repentance. If you do these things, the nations right will come to meet you. Verse three, they're breaking up the follow ground, and verse four is an invitation to trust to kind of come back to the family to trust in Yahweh or in God. So those four verses kind of go together as a unit, and the next one verses are going to be basically different word images uh, for repentance and. Jeremiah trying to get the people to repent. So before we move on, is there any questions about verses 1 through 4? Anything that doesn't make sense? Okay. Would somebody like to read then Jeremiah 4, verses 5 through 9? Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves. And let us go into the fortified cities, set up the standard toward Zion, take refuge, do not delay. For I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket and a destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitants. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. So in this image here, we have starting in verse 5, right? There's going to be a, a blowing of the trumpet, warning of the invading army. They would have that signals. And... Um, they're, instead of going out to fight the enemy, they're going to run into the citadels or the fortified cities. Set the, the standards there in verse 6. That would be the, showing the quickest way of um, safety, to run away. And then Babylon is described in verse 7, the Babylonians, as a, like a killer lion coming from the north, destroying all the nations in its path. Then verse 9 will describe the reaction of the people, kind of like a 
In ancient times, battles were very bloody, and sometimes soldiers would freeze on the battlefield, unable to move, just standing there helplessly to be slaughtered. And that's what's happening to the leaders. The princes, the priests, the prophets will see this and it will become utterly helpless with fear. And now we're going to have one of the first, I think the first in Jeremiah, chapter, Jeremiah of Jeremiah's lament in verse 10. Um, verse 10 reads, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying you shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches to the heart. So the comment on that, this verse is probably one of the most difficult verses to interpret in the book of Jeremiah. It is a lament or cry to God by Jeremiah upon the revelation of God's wrath to him in the, these previous verses, 5 through 9. Did God mislead the people? We're going to go over some of these verses below to answer that question. So first, can God lie? Let's look at Numbers 23, verse 19. And this is, oh, the story of Balaam and Balak. And Balak was a pagan kind of priest who then prophesied under, actually, the Holy Spirit because uh, ba Balak wanted Balaam to curse the Israelites. Would somebody read, then, Numbers uh, 23, verse 19? Now, so God cannot lie. He doesn't deceive us or lie to us. It goes against his nature. So the second question then, well, who was prophesying then judgment, right? Um, we, I think we'll look at Jeremiah. Well, I think we'll skip that. If you look at verses 5 through 9, right, it's Jeremiah prophesying judgment. Um, we'll skip Jeremiah 1, verses 14 and 16, but that's also him prophesying judgment there. So the third question, who then was prophesying you shall have peace in verse 10? Well, take a look at Jeremiah 14, verses 13 and 14. And would somebody like to read Jeremiah 14, verses 13 and 14? prophets, those whom God did not send, they were the ones prophesying, you shall have peace. So it wasn't Jeremiah or any of the other prophets living during Jeremiah's time who were from Yahweh or from the Lord. So then we're going to have a quote I'll read in a second. But um, kind of to understand this, I think we should look at 2 Kings chapter 22. And this is the story of wicked King Ahab, uh, who was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And he and the southern kingdom make an alliance to go out to a battle. And the king from Judah wants to know, is there any prophets from the Lord here who can uh, give us a word whether we should do this or not? Because Ahab had all his all prophets with false prophets with him. And they were saying, oh, go out and fight. You will be successful. So 2 Kings, uh, chapter 22, verses 20 through 23. Oh, I wonder if I got that wrong. Oh. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's too bad. Well, I'll have to just like, summarize what it was. I, I must have got the wrong reference on there. What happened was is King Ahab is there, and um, the king of Judah says, 
King of Judah says, there are any other prophets here of the Yahweh? So they bring in one of the prophets from Yahweh, one of the true prophets. And he's kind of sarcastic, and he says, yeah, you can have peace. You'll be successful. And the king is like, why do you always speak to me this way? He gets mad, King Ahab does. And so, king, so the prophet then replies, all right, I saw before um, the throne of God different spirits, and God says, who shall go and deceive King Ahab, who will walk to King Ahab? And one spirit says one thing, one spirit says another. And then one spirit says, I will go and deceive Ahab. And God says, how will you do it? And the spirit says, I will be a lying word in his, prophet's mouth, his false prophet's mouth. And God says, all right, go ahead and do that. So, oh, is it in 1 Kings? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, here it is. All right, I'll read it. And the Lord said, in 1 Kings chapter 22, starting at verse 20, And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, In what way? So he said, I will go, be, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said to him, you shall persuade him, and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has decreed, declared disaster against you. So what does that mean? Well, there's a quote here they have on the bottom. And basically, this is what that means. The deception of the people by such discourse from the false prophet is referred back to God. The Lord thou hast deceived. Inasmuch as God not only permits these lying spirits to appear and work, but has ordained them and brought them forth for the hardening of the people's heart, as he once caused the spirit of prophecy to inspire as a lying spirit the prophets of Ahab. So what's happening is God sometimes allows these evil spirits to do their work of evil. God is not the author of evil. He doesn't actually deceive. But he lets these evil spirits do it. And he does it as a, kind of a, as a punishment for the sin of obduration, sometimes it's called, which means hardening of the heart, continual unrepentance. Uh, in the New Testament, it's called the sin against the Holy Spirit. God's word can be so repeatedly despised and spurned by an individual that finally God allows that person to stay in a hardened state or an uncircumcised state. Uh, if you think back of Pharaoh and Moses, right, Moses continually comes to Pharaoh with God's word, and Pharaoh continually hardens his heart, refuses to listen, and then finally it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart, meaning that God has withdrawn his hand from Pharaoh and has allowed Pharaoh to stay in that hardened state. Jeremiah, in this verse, verse 10 then, is lamenting as a warning to Judah to repent while they still have God's word and while they still have a chance. Are there any questions about that? We'll talk a little bit more about that, the hardening of the heart at the end of the Bible class. All right, well, let's go back to Jeremiah, chapter 4. Verses 11 through 13 read, At that time it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, A dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness for the daughter of my people not to fans or to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come for me. Now I will, speak, I will also speak judgment against them. Behold, he shall come up like clouds, and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. Those are the next kind of image of God's wrath or their punishment they're going to have if they don't repent. And this is... There's a little description there of some of the historical background, what that means. In uh, their climate, they were really, the wind was very important, so they got the wind from the Mediterranean Sea there. They would get moisture and rain, which would help their crops. Um, but if they got the desert wind, the ser how do they say it? Oh, the Seraco, then it would actually like wither up their plants. It would be bad. Kind of like here in the Midwest, we all talk about the weather quite a bit because farming is really important. 
And the same thing back then. If the wind came, the east wind from the desert would come too soon, it would destroy their crops. So this is kind of describing the judgment. The Babylonians were going to come like a desert wind and wither everything up, which would be the people. Verse 14, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness, that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? So this is another invitation to believe, similar to verse 4, circumcise your hearts. The people of Judah, at the end of verse 13, cried out, woe to us. But Jeremiah is saying there's still hope, repent and believe. 15 through 18 now. For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from the Mount Ephraim. Make mention to the nations. Yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and raise their voices against the cities of Judah. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter because it reaches to your heart. So here's some more word images. Watchers are like those people who, um, you know, sheep and cattle out in the fields, and they would watch them, and if a harmful animal would come, they would sound the alarm, they would all come and surround that animal and then kill it. So that's what the Babylonians are like. They're like watchers, these people, they're going to come and surround Judah and uh, trap them like a wild animal. Verses 19 through 21 would be another lament from, of Jeremiah's. O oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because you have heard, O oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered, and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? So this is Jeremiah's lament. It's also the designed to bring out repentance. And this brings to mind that theology and doctrine is personal. Um, at the seminary my past year, the two students get to preach a sermon, uh, the seminary, pr the class president, and then the different president. And Christian Preuss was actually one of the presidents that year, and he gave a sermon about how doctrine is personal. Sometimes we kind of say, you know, when I come up to say something to somebody, I'll say, don't take this personally, but, you know, I kind of get that caveat out there. But with theology, in God's word, it's meant, it, do, it is personal. It, does, it is meant to be taken personally, and it will offend. Um, it will offend the unbeliever like Judah. And sometimes it will even offend us Christians at times because we have the old Adam. And it will hurt. And this is what Jeremiah is speaking about. Is let, it's going to hurt this word of law, severe law, but, that's not, but repent while you have the chance. So verse 22 now is God's answer. For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. So God's answer to that question, how long, that Jeremiah raises from verses 19 to 21, is as long as the people stay in their foolish or their stupid unrepentance, basically. Uh, there's a saying, you can't fix stupid. I don't know if you ever heard, see that in those those funny plaques they have like in the gas stations. And that's some truth to it, right? Um, only God can fix the stupidity of unbelief, and that is what he's trying to do here with Jeremiah through his word. Would somebody like to read verses 23 through 29 of Jeremiah 4? cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, but I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above the black. Because I have spoken, I have purposed and will not relent, nor will I, nor will I turn back from it. But the whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. Okay, so this next kind of word image we have here 
Jeremiah is describing the coming Babylonian as like an undoing of creation. Um, verse 23 there, the, the earth was without form and void. Kind of going back to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the earth was without form and void. So just as there was nothing and there was light and God made everything, so everything is like going backwards order. I have a little chart there between Jeremiah and Genesis for you to see. So in question, in verse 27, there is still a promise that yet I will not make a full end. See Leviticus 26 in, in those verses. Why is the promise of a remnant being spared comforting? So Leviticus chapter 26, and let's read um, 27 and 28 first. This is describing kind of like um, what would happen in the future if Israel was to fall away from God. So verses 27 and 28. Let me take a little bit of switch. Okay. And after all this, if you do not obey me but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I will chastise you seven times for your sin. So that's kind of the, the discourse here that God is giving. And if you look over now to verses 44 and 45, so we're going to skip over the middle of that. God says, Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them, to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. For the sake, but for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So what will be the comforting of there will not be a full end to um, Judah? Yeah, he, he won't lie. He'll keep them. He'll, that's what the covenant there is in Leviticus, that promise. Um, and it's also comforting for us in the church, right? We see a lot of problems in our society, and we have the promise that the gates of hell shall not overcome it. We know that no matter what might happen, there will always be a faithful remnant. Whenever there's judgment, there's always a remnant that's preserved. And most importantly, too, if all the Jews would have been destroyed, right, with the coming of the Babylonians, that messianic line uh, the, that Jesus was supposed to descend from would have been wiped out. One of the prom another one of those promises. So there would have been no more Jews left. There would have been no Savior. So, so God still says there will be not a full end. There will still be somebody left. I will still keep my promises, just even through these hard times. Any questions before we go to the last two verses of Jeremiah? Chapter 4. Okay, let's go back to Jeremiah 4 then. In verses 30 and 31, I'll read. And when you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will not seek your life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child. The voice of the daughter of Zion, bewailing herself. She spreads her hand, saying, Woe is me, woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. So the, our note here. This is the last word image that God uses for repentance. Judah is so impenitent that they are like a youth prostitute who has become, from her activity, aged, aged and ugly. She tries to beautify herself with gaudy finery and cosmetics, but her lovers, the other nations, who used her when they found her profitable, now despise her, seeking to take her life. And here's a quote. She, that's Judah, refused to yield her soul, her life, to her maker, her husband, her redeemer. She must yield it to murderers who sought her life while posing as lovers. So the question, what kind of sorrow does Judah have in verse 31 there of chapter 4? It, Woe is me, for my soul is weary because of my murderers. Kind of not really a sorrow of, of um, realizing they did something wrong. It's more of a sorrow of the consequences of their actions. Kind of like Judas 
right? His sorrow, he could have repented, but instead he went out and hung himself. Um, it's a sorrow of being caught, of these things happening to me, woe is me, instead of coming back to Christ, back to God. So the summary now of our chapter. What does Jeremiah 4 teach concerning repentance? And I have a quote here from the Augsburg Confession, and I'll kind of go through that. Now, strictly speaking, repentance consists of two parts. One part is contrition, that is terror striking the conscience through the knowledge of sin. And that's called the law. God's using Jeremiah to preach his word of law so that Judah would wake up from her impenitence. And we saw that in verses 1 and 2, 5 and 9 with the image of that killer lion, verses 11 and 13 with the wind, the desert wind, verses 15 through 18 with the watchers who are surrounding an animal to kill it, verses 23 through 29 of the undoing of creation, and the, these last two verses of a used prostitute being about to be murdered by her lovers. The other part is faith, which is born of the gospel, Romans 10, verse 17, of the absolution, that means forgiveness, and believes that for Christ's sake, sins are forgiven. It comforts the conscience and delivers it from terror. So this call to faith was in verse 4, right? Circumcise your hearts. And it was also in verse 14. Come back to, to, to the Lord. Kind of rejoin the family. Then good works are bound to follow, which are the fruits of repentance, Galatians chapter 5. So repentance cannot be just some sort of externalism, um, kind of an outward show, but an actual turn of behavior. To repent literally, literally means to turn around. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who deny that those who have once been justified can lose the Holy Spirit. So a, a Christian can lose the Holy Spirit. That's in verse 10 there. That hardening, the sin of abjuration, uh, it's possible for somebody to start to refuse to listen to God's word and over and over and eventually be hardened. We don't know when that takes place in an individual. We know that in the case of Pharaoh because God's word tells us. They also condemn those who argue that some may reach a state of perfection in this life that they cannot sin. Kind of perfect sanctification idea. As a Christian, though, our life is one of continual repentance. Um, we have to continually repent because we have that old Adam. And that's what God's word here in Jeremiah 4 is talking about. Life on, this, uh, on earth is a sojourning or a pilgrimage. Right? Eternity is our goal. We'll, so when we hear God's word, sometimes it's, it's to help us in that pilgrimage. And it's important when we hear the, God's law to take it personally. It might hurt us even at times. It might offend us. But also to take the gospel personally. And that is that it is Christ who will circumcise your heart so that you can believe in him. And he's the one who takes away your sin and washes you and cleanses you. We have a couple minutes left. Are there any comments or questions before we close? Yes, Gail. Love the Lord your God. We will keep his commandments. Yeah. Yep, the Holy Spirit helps us keep, keep that. And when we sin, um, we repent. Yeah? Yeah, sir. There was, um, in a, I think it's chapter, or verse 20. Yeah. It says, my curtains in a moment. Yeah. Um, Jeremiah is using a picture of, like, um, a tent. So he's imagining Bedouins or those nomads. They would live in tents. So it's like a, you're like you're setting up a tent, and sometimes they would have raiders, you know, in the desert. The nomads would raid each other. So it's like a... He's like a nomad, he's kind of using that image of a nomad, having his tent all of a sudden taken and ripped away out from underneath him. Any other questions or comments? All right, why don't we go ahead and close this prayer then? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jeremiah chapter 4, that we may learn from it that what, is, what you 
what repentance is, that is contrition over sin and faith in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.